Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our BCSQI fall quarterly meeting. Thanks all for being here with us tonight. We have a couple quick housekeeping items, then we will launch into our agenda. I just want to give a, a quick reminder uh, for everybody about our Zoom etiquette here. This is an open Zoom meeting, so we encourage everybody's collaboration and participation. Uh, we just ask that if you have any background noise, please stay muted. Um, you can interact via the chat box. You can take yourselves off of mute, raise your hands, all the cool Zoom features. Uh, Sherry's number is here as well if you need assistance uh, or, or just somebody to talk to. Sherry's great. So those are our Zoom controls. We also have CME credits available for this evening's meeting. So if you can please put your name in the chat. Uh, that will help us make sure that you are counted here. Afterwards, we will follow up with instructions about claiming those. Basically, you just need to fill out a quick survey uh, via the VCU cloud portal, and they can uh, email you a certificate. It's CMEs, and then there's also CEU equivalents you can get if you're not an MD. So that is, uh, that is an option for everybody on the line, hopefully. Our agenda tonight will feature the heart team approach to valve cases with a specific focus on both mitral and tricuspid procedures. Uh, but first we will kick it over to our chairman, Dr. Robert Shore for a welcome and highlights from the board. Dr. Shore. Thank you so very much and welcome to everyone. I hope you all have had a great and wonderful summer as we transition into the fall. The weather, at least in Northern Virginia has been spectacular and hope everyone else is having lovely weather. I did want to go over a couple items, highlight. Uh, first, uh, from a financial standpoint, we remain uh, stable and uh, pretty uh, close to exactly on budget, which is a good thing. Uh, we had a discussion regarding VCSQI biostatistician, uh, heard some proposals and we'll be moving forward as this is important as we move forward with our research endeavors and um, we'll give an update in the future. There are three board seats coming to term at the end of uh, this year. There are Dr. Spear, Dr. Rich and myself, all of whom have graciously uh, willing to continue participation. We did talk about moving the three of us in sequence Jeff Rich is already an at-large, and then Dr. Spear, and then myself after completion of my board and post-board year to uh, an at-large seat, opening up uh, additional seats. We also talked about um, having a one-year board seat to increase access to the board experience to include APPs, nurses, FITs, non-physicians, and to encourage greater engagement. So if you're interested in potentially being on the one-year board seat, uh, please let uh, Eddie know, uh, let one of the board members know, and we'll be likely proceeding with that in the near future as well. We also had an, a recruiting update. We've added one additional practice, welcome. Uh, Eddie can give the details and there are a couple others that are uh, in process, as well as we continue to expand to complete our footprint in the Commonwealth. Uh, we also talked about December 8th meeting as to whether it should be a hybrid meeting allowing for in-person or should remain a, a virtual meeting. And at the end of some of the data presentation before the meet of the meeting and the other presentations, we will have a quick survey to those that are on the call to see about interest in a hybrid in-person uh, meeting versus what we've been doing for the remainder of the time with COVID. Uh, that's a brief summary of the items that we reviewed in uh, the board meeting. If you have additional questions or comments, please let us know either in the chat or speak to us offline. You can always reach out to Eddie or myself or Sherry, and we're happy to help. With that, I will pass it on to Eddie. 
Thank you, Dr. Shore. And before I launch into the data, just a quick review of our VCSQI strategic plan with our mission of transforming cardiovascular care to improve patient experience and value, our vision of optimizing heart care outcomes through national collaboration, innovation, and research. So with that in mind, let's jump into a couple quick VCSQI database updates. Uh, it's been a little while since we presented this to the entire group, so I wanted to just give a state of the union with regards to our databases, where we are, and where we're going. So uh, as you all know, VCSQI started out with the adult cardiac surgery database, uh, and we continue to accumulate cases in that realm. Uh, I think we're almost at 150,000 patients on that side. With the addition of interventional cardiology, we added the ACC CAF PCI database. And at, th at this point, we've actually, uh, we have, I believe, 20 members who are submitting data to that registry for us at this point, and uh, almost 60,000 patients in that world, just uh, because the, the patients are a little bit higher volume than STS. So uh, a good wealth of knowledge is coming through on the ACC side. The STEMI database is our latest uh, one to be finalized. We have 17 centers submitting us uh, STEMI data right now through chest pain MI, uh, the ACC's database, and soon to be uh, from the AHA's Get With the Guidelines CAD module. Uh, and that should be online here very, very soon. And our next piece, which actually ties in to the presentations tonight, is the STS ACC TVT registry. We have actually one center who sent their data in successfully. We're not going to single them out tonight and show their their data to everybody, but uh, we anticipate more coming soon. We do have uh, eight other centers who are positioned to upload TVT data to us in the coming weeks here. So please look out for uh, for that request for you all. These are all housed by our data partner, uh, Armus Health Catalyst, who is our database and reporting system. So these are our clinical data sources. We'll show just a couple quick data views. Uh, first from our STEMI registry, this is uh, our STEMI summary metrics by VHAC region. Uh, and against the VCSQI aggregate, which is about 17 centers right now. Our five measures are median door in, door out time for transfer patients, median transfer time between hospitals, FMC to primary PCI, less than 90 minutes, uh, the percentage, and median FMC to primary PCI, both for non transfers. And lastly, the percentage of patients with pre hospital EKGs administered. Dr. O'Brien or Dr. Shore, any comments with our, of our uh, STEMI summary report card here? Um, no, I, 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 uh, this looks this looks very good. I mean, obviously, we still have some opportunities in in different areas, um, but I think from what we started with, uh, I think the data is coming together. You know, initially, just to me, this looks um, more reflective of sort of. Uh, real life uh, conditions for STEMI care on the ground, but uh, very, very excited how this is coming along. Still very eager to make the N, the number of centers in this uh, data set larger. So, you know, for all of our participants tonight, we strongly encourage uh, uh, encouraging your hospitals to get on board, um, to reach out to Eddie or myself. Uh, we ultimately, our goal is to have all 43 or 45 uh, 24 seven PCI centers part of this data set. Um, it, it's getting more robust by the month, but um, you know we're really hoping to include everybody. Um, that's our vision, but uh, interesting stuff. And, and, and also we, you know, there's a lot of different things we can track. We've gotten a lot of great suggestions from our stakeholders. We, we tried to keep this initial effort uh, for STEMI data collection focused on the things that we thought were the highest value in terms of driving uh, good reperfusion times and ultimately then good outcomes. Um, we will, you know, potentially be adding stuff to this data set in the future. But for, again, for now, we tried to hone in on five things that we thought really made a difference. The only other item I would add, um, Pete had alluded to the fact that we have about half of the centers participating. 
but when I last checked, we had more than 70% of the actual STEMI cases uh, performed in, or the uh, PCI, the STEMI cases that were done in Virginia. So um, while the, we want to in, improve the footprint and engage other programs, the number of cases that we're talking about is substantial. So the data I think is robust. That's an excellent point, thank you. And we can see some of this robustness when we look at the data by center here. So this is an example of our hospital level reports here for STEMI procedures. This is the proportion receiving radial access for the last two rolling four quarter periods compared against one another in yellow and blue respectively. Uh, and in green is the VCSQI rate, which with about 70% radial access. For those centers that are not radial access, um, it would be interesting to know since vascular access site is tied to vascular complications, what the impediments are to transitioning to radial approach. We know it's not obviously possible in every case, but we can see from the volume that it's uh, about 70%. So there are some outliers that do provide an opportunity uh, for us to be able to understand how we might improve the situation. You know, I would also add uh, sometimes uh, a powerful uh, impulse or impetus rather for change is just showing your stakeholders at your institution this data. Um, and sometimes that will, if people see that, you know, peer organizations, peer centers potentially have higher rates of radial artery usage that often will prompt changes in clinical behaviors. I think we all kind of, um, you know, aspire to practice at the highest level possible. And we're all interested in what our uh, friends and neighbors are doing. And uh, that can sometimes you look at it and go, oh boy, you know, why are we, we need to do more radials. I guess is the, the, my point. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. And the couple of metrics here I, I've selected do have a fair amount of variation between hospital performance levels. This next is same day discharge for elective PCIs. So you notice this ranges anywhere from, you know, about 10% all the way up to above 80%, depending on the center. And the ACC benchmark and VCSQI are between 45 and 50. One other area where VCSQI has focused a lot recently is uh, acute kidney injury. So these are the AKI rates for all PCI patients across our centers. Again, they range from under 5% to over 10% based on the facility. Um, the caveat here is this only includes patients who have their creatinines tested pre and post procedure. So the denominator does vary a little bit by center. But based on the good work of our AKI committee, we uh, provided a set of recommendations to programs on how they can mitigate the incidence of AKI both uh, post-cath and post-surgery. So we will keep tracking these going forward. Last PCI metric is median door to balloon time by VCSQI operator. So our median here is 61 minutes with a range of 30 to 132 minutes. jump into a couple STS metrics here. This is our open heart volume by year and procedure. See, again, it's still mostly cabbage and our valves are here on the right. A uh, little bit of a little bit of a downward slope on some of the charts. Keep in mind the 2022 is only half a year though. And we can think about our mitral 
uh, surgical procedures here with respect to the transcatheter talks that we will hear tonight as well. Here is one chart showing 30-day readmission rates for isolated cabbage patients. Our VCSQI rate is about 9%, similar to STS. Uh, again, a varying degree of performance between centers. Uh, this is an area where we are starting to tackle or retackle uh, a readmission protocol with the help of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association. So please uh, join that work group if you're not part of it, and we will look to update this, uh, this group on our findings here in the coming months and uh, quarters. All right, before we get to our primary presentations tonight, as Dr. Shore mentioned, we will launch a quick poll on our December quarterly meeting preferences, whether or not uh, we should do an in-person meeting and we will still have a hybrid uh, meeting model. So in-person and virtual would both be offered or virtual only uh, like we're doing this evening. So please take a minute to vote on this. See, we've got about 18, 20 respondents. Our meetings typically are held in person when the in-person option is available, either Charlottesville or Richmond. So we try to do a centralized, uh, centralized location that's within at least a couple hours of everybody. All right, we have 29 of 33. Any last? That's a pretty good sample size here. So we have 17 who responded for the hybrid option, 12 for virtual only. Any thoughts, comments to share with regards to our December 8 meeting? If you didn't have an opportunity to enter your vote, um, if it passed too quickly for you to vote, uh, just send your thoughts uh, in the chat box to Sherry or, or to Eddie and we'll include them. Thanks, Dr. Shore. And we will look to share a formal determination for our December 8 meeting here uh, in the coming weeks. And so now we will kick off our featured presentations this evening. Uh, again, our program is Advances in Tricuspid and Mitral Valve Therapies. Uh, our first presenter is Dr. Keenan Ewent from UVA. Dr. Ewent is the Surgical Director of the UVA Structural Heart and Valve Center, co-directs the UVA Aortic Center and UVA Advanced Coronary Artery Program. He's a site investigator for Repair MR, a study comparing the mitral clip procedure to traditional open and minimally invasive mitral valve repair. He's also involved in multiple studies investigating surgical approaches for mitral, tricuspid, and mitral valve replacement, as well as one trial evaluating a next generation TAVR device. Dr. Yunt, it's an honor to welcome you to our VCSQI meeting tonight. Thanks, everybody. Um, Eddie, do I share my screen or do you all have my slides? I can give you control here. If okay. you click the screen here, you should be able to advance them. Awesome. Um, well, I'm happy to give this talk and uh, Eric and Jason and Paul and I sort of tried to come up with a good format for this meeting and we felt like maybe 10 minute talks each on surgical and uh, sort of broad overviews of surgery and transcatheter approaches to mitral disease would be a good starting point. And then we'll try to make most of our discussion lively with panel discussion a little bit later on. Uh, I was tasked with talking about uh, surgical strategies for mitral valve repair uh, and replacement. And uh, again, I'm gonna keep it brief. Um, Eddie, to advance, what do I need to do? You can use your up and down arrows. That works a little bit easier. Okay, sounds good. 
So again, I just show the, the classic surgeon's view of the valve and sort of what we see, which is obviously a little bit different than what you see on echo. Uh, and this sort of showing here a very classic pathology of, of the P2 region. Um, and generally that's sort of often the, the pathology we're, we're faced with is some prolapsing segment of the valve and degenerative disease. Uh, and I'm gonna limit a lot of my discussion here on repair to degenerative disease. Um, and you can see here, this is just sort of shows you what echocardiographically what you'd be looking at, but uh, flail on the uh, left side of the screen and restriction on the right side of the screen and sort of which way the jet's going to go dependent on uh, the pathology I have. And then again, just sort of correlating that picture I just showed, you can see an overriding posterior leaflet there. This is that classic P2 flail. Uh, which is the one surgeons hope to see uh, when they're going in to repair the valve because it's very easy to fix usually. And you can see this anterior jet um, away from the flail segment, whereas if the leaflet were tethered down in restriction, um, usually the jet would be the other way and it would not be prolapsing above the annular plane like it clearly is there. Uh, usually the restrictive pathologies are, are not amenable to repair or or have sort of dubious outcomes compared to replacement. And again, here's sort of a 3D correlation of that. It brings you back to the original picture I showed. Uh, so how do we repair them? Um, Surgically, uh, there are a couple of different approaches. Uh, sternotomy is sort of the tried and true classic approach, been done for years that way. Uh, and over the past 25, 20 years, uh, a lot of evolution in trying to do this in a more minimally invasive fashion, uh, with a lot of surgeons moving to a, uh, to a right thoracotomy approach, uh, usually a mini thoracotomy through about the fourth or fifth inner space. And I've got a picture of that here. You can see femoral cannulation to um, get the whole bypass circuit out of the chest. Um, usually a camera port below the working port that they have right there. Uh, a variety of different clamps that surgeons can use uh, either directly through that port, uh, which is how I do it, uh, or some people make a separate stab incision uh, like they're doing in this picture. And then other people use a, a endo balloon that actually um, is a balloon that occludes the aorta from the inside uh, and delivers cardioplegia that way. Uh, no right or wrong answer, just a lot of different approaches with a lot of strong opinions and, and comfort level as to what uh, the surgeon's uh, most comfortable with. Um, but I'd say overall, these are sort of, and then some people may or may not add the robot in for this sort of general setup. Um, with, with the advantage being perhaps a little less rib spreading, uh, better visualization with the robot. Uh, often the techniques, uh, I can't say have changed all that much over the past 20 years. Uh, triangular resection, sort of a classic way of correcting uh, degenerative prolapse. Uh, artificial cords have probably gained sort of more favor in the past decade or so. Uh, an edge-to-edge -edge repair um, sort of also remains a strategy in use for some people. And I'm going to have um, sort of dedicated slides to that. And then sort of as a last point, almost everybody adds an annuloplasty um, to whatever their um, leaflet techniques they use to repair the valve. So in terms of triangular resection, um, this is sort of a good example here from a paper, but it, sort of takes that first picture I showed you of a, of a prolapse segment. And usually you create a triangle with the uh, base of the triangle up near the where the uh, free edge of the leaflet is. So you can see the ruptured cords there. And then it sort of goes very narrow back to the annulus. Um, usually I don't take it quite as far to the annulus as this picture shows, but it, the principle remains the same. Uh, and then you put it back together. Um, some people do a quadrangular resection, which is a little more involved of an operation um, and actually sort of detach the leaflet from the annulus and tighten the valve that way um, and put it all back together. Some people, rather than resecting this, will just do a folding plasty and sort of create a valve that essentially all this 
tissue gets buried on the ventricular side and uh, they don't resect anything, but they create, by the way they suture it, they create the same effect. Uh, and people have a variety of different vocabulary for that technique, folding, plastic, imbrication, it's all the same thing. And it all gets the same principle, but it tightens up that posterior leaflet. Uh, so that sort of is like a like a double door mechanism, but the one of the doors is much shorter and stiffer than the other, and it's sort of a guardrail for the other anterior leaflet to flap onto. And that's often how it looks on echo post repair. Uh, artificial cords, um, again, I spoke to this a little bit as a more advanced technique, uh, but you t usually take two bites into the papillary muscle itself, uh, and then usually um, two bites the leaflet, and then tie them down. Uh, some of the newer repair devices, uh, the annuloplasty systems have little guides on how to size these in terms of the height. That's usually the trickier part. Uh, some people just eyeball it and see where it tends to uh tends to prolapse the least um i'd say in my practice i use this more on the anterior leaflet and very rarely on the posterior leaflet uh, and that's probably the majority of how surgeons repair valves uh, at least anterior pathology is with cords and then going to another technique uh, is the edge to edge it's an alfieri uh, and, and essentially all this means is that you suture the anterior leaflet to the posterior leaflet in a certain segment of the valve, uh, usually where it's most diseased. Um, it was described sort of initially as a bailout technique, um, and it also helps avoid um, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve after repairs, which is sometimes something we see. Um, and it's actually what uh, I know Jason will probably talk about this, but it, it's with the technology that or it's the technique on which the mitra clip is based on. So an edge to edge repair. Um, and there you see the graspers. Um, and I'd say largely within surgical technique, I, I rarely use it unless it's a, a large degenerative Barlow's valve. Uh, I might use it centrally uh, or going to the next slide. Um, sometimes I'll use this sort of same principle for uh a3 or p3 disease uh with the large with the valve that has a large uh, orifice area you can pretty effectively treat commissural or p3 uh, mediated mr by closing down the commissure and usually enough of the valve is still open so that you haven't narrowed it but that's obviously the the achilles heel of this technique is if you the more central you are with your alfieri the the more likely the arc to cause stenosis And then just sort of the last thing, this is pretty much basic to any mitral valve repair and um, sort of dealer's choice on how to do it. Some people use a full ring, some people use a band, some people use a stiff ring, some people use a very flexible ring or band, um, and there's there's no right or wrong answer and people change throughout the course of their career. Um, you'll see probably a lot more of the flexible solutions and robotic or more minimally invasive surgeries just because it's easier to get the flexible band and sew it in uh, through a small incision. And with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you so much, Dr. Yun. So we will, I believe, have a panel discussion at the end, but up next, I will introduce Cherie Emore, uh, who will provide this, the stage for our next speaker. Cherie is the she Senior Director for CVI Quality at Carillion, and she will introduce uh, our next speaker. So Cherie, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. So much for having us. Can you hear me okay, Eddie? Yes, ma'am. All right. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Jason Forst, who is our uh, structural interventionalist at Croyan Clinic. He joined and started the program um, for the structural heart and valve program at Croyan in 2012, um, has worked to build the um, fellowship program on, it in, uh, on our eighth fellow thus far, has certainly um, built a breadth of uh, structural procedures uh, for Carillion with tavern, mitroclip, and left atrial appendage, um, PFO, and ASD, and is the PI for numerous trials. And we are um, very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Jason Forst. Thank you, Sheree. So Dr. Forrest, it's, it's all yours if you'd like to share your screen here. Here we go. All 
All right, tell me, did I do it? Good job, yes. Great, all right. All right, thank you guys. This is my first uh, meeting with you. I hope I got the acronym right up there. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity. I've been hearing about you through our STEMI programs, which didn't look too stellar, by the way, <laughs> if we're the rest region. Ouch, we'll work on that. Um, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'm gonna usurp a little bit of Paul Mahoney's time because he was gonna talk about transcatheter tricuspid therapies, and I can talk about them, but I didn't really have time to get some slides together. So I'm just gonna spend a little bit extra time on some of the mitral valve therapies um, that are available. A lot of very cutting edge stuff. Um, many, many clinical trials out there. So uh, we'll just get to touch on a little bit of each of them. All right, so um, I think you already quickly cruised through at the surgical side. Obviously, this is a very common uh, problem. Mitral regurgitation exists um, throughout the US with many, many millions of patients. Um, clearly, they're symptomatic with the short heart, shortness of breath, get heart failure, pulmonary hypertension. Um, both ischemic mechanisms and then uh, non-ischemic mechanisms like we talked about here with the degenerative mitral regurgitation here in the previous surgical discussion. Um, this is an incredibly important problem because as you can see, as the mitral regurgitation uh, worsens, the L increases the load on the ventricle and then the ventricle worsens and you have this sort of vicious cycle. And you can see here on the right that the, the prognosis of patients uh, with heart failure that have developed functional mitral regurgitation uh, is quite terrible. Um, Furthermore, as you saw a little bit about the echo uh, on the previous talk, uh, you know, mitral regurgitation from a cardiology standpoint is, is pretty tricky. You know, the surgeons sort of get, get the mitral regurgitation patients after we've, hopefully we've done all this work, but we have to figure out, you know, the mechanism of mitral regurgitation and then and the extent, and that can be very difficult because it's very dynamic. So from patient to patient, uh, we're going to see differences in, in um, blood pressure, volume status, other volume, other uh, valve disease, such as concomitant aortic stenosis, which can potentially worsen the mitral regurgitation. And then all these eccentric jets that can complicate quantification. Um, so it, it can be very tricky. It's not quite as straightforward as aortic stenosis, which I know you guys already talked about. Um, and then as we get into the percutaneous therapies, um, we have similar problems uh, in that not only do we have to figure out the extent and the mechanism, but just getting devices to the mitral valve can be very challenging. The mitral valve is much less accessible than the aortic valve. Um, it's, not, it's not a circle, you know, it's saddle shaped, it's um, more elliptical. Um, there are other structures involved, you know, in, the, in aortic stenosis, we pretty much just need to worry about where the coronaries sit. Um, in this case, we've got uh, coronary arteries, coronary sinus uh, around the mitral valve annulus. We've got the, the left ventricle and the outflow tract. We've got um, left atrial appendage, and then the cords and the papillary muscles all to deal with here. So it's a much more complicated uh, situation. So with that, we'll talk about some of the mitral repair uh, solutions that have, that have been developed. Um, the, the most commercially available and the one that I think everybody knows about is this concept of edge to edge repair. Uh, nowadays, we're going to have to get away from the word mitral clip. We're going to have to start talking about the concept of tier, transcatheter edge to edge repair. So this is sort of a little history of all of the different edge to edge repair uh, studies. Um, probably the most pivotal uh, study is the is the COAP trial, which really was a major, major game changer for for percutaneous mitral valve therapies because we didn't know if, if treating functional mitral regurgitation was, was really going to be um, worthwhile. Uh, the surgical literature has not been very robust up to date. Uh, treating functional mitral regurgitation surgically has never really been proven uh, to substantially impact uh, mortality. And so the COAP trial was, was uh, honestly uh, sort of blew my mind. Um, oh no, my computer just crashed. All right, awesome. I'll, I'll add them. But basically, the the uh, while I pull this up, I'm gonna. Sorry, now I got a dog barking, and I'm trying to pull up my PowerPoint. Hang on.
Thanks everybody for your patience here. Are, are there any uh, questions or comments thus far as we're uh, about to get Dr. Forrest back online here? All right, am I still sharing guys? You will need to reshare. All right, well, here we are. You see it? Yes, sir. All right, sorry guys. I don't know, this computer crashed on me. Anyway, I'm gonna cruise through here. So bottom line is a uh, co-op trial. I, you know, I, I thought it was gonna be one of these sort of mediocre trials where heart failure hospitalizations was gonna be positive and that was pretty much it. Uh, but it turned out that it, all the secondary endpoints were met. So there was a substantial mortality improvement, heart failure improvement, um, New York Heart Association improvement. So across the board, patients felt better as compared to medical therapy. So this was basically the, the primary game changer for percutaneous therapies for mitral valve. And I think it's what sets the stage for everything else we're gonna talk about. But you can see here now at, out at three years, there's a, still a substantial reduction in heart failure readmissions, um, substantial um, improvement in mortality all the way up to three years. Uh, and with this, we got a class 2A guideline for, for doing transcatheter or transcatheter edge to edge repair for, for patients with uh, heart failure and also for DMR for patients that are at high risk. So uh, interestingly today, the other, the other competitor device besides the mitra clip here um, is the uh, Pascal from Edwards. And so that was actually FDA approved today. Um, so we now have two commercially available edge-to-edge -edge repair devices, one from Abbott, one from, from Edwards. Um, both of them have basically the same concept here. We're gonna approximate uh, the two leaflets, similar to the concept of Alfieri stitch that you heard about previously. Now, it's interesting that the Alfieri stitch surgically is considered sort of a last ditch effort, but uh, you know, in the percutaneous world, we're, we're, we're saving them all of the other comorbidities of having a sternotomy or having a, a thoracotomy, putting people on heart-lung machines. And so I, I think we're seeing uh, a more benefit, although I, I like the idea that we, we really should be considering uh, co-therapies like annuloplasty bands and rings, which is what's done surgically. So that's going to be something to watch out for down the road uh, years later. But uh, essentially, we have now MitraClip that is available in multiple sizes, uh, which has been game changing for us in terms of getting better results long term. And then uh, now again, we have this uh, Edwards device as well that has some nuances. It's a little bit easier to stay out of the cords. It doesn't have uh, some of the the uh, the um, interactions with those gripper grippers that you see on the on the left. It makes it a little bit easier to get dive, dive down and not get entangled in the cords, and it's got a little spacer, and it, it makes uh, it fill the effective uh, regurgitant orifice area a little bit better. So it'll be interesting to see how these two uh, devices play out in the in the actual marketplace. Um, the Pascal device is still uh, awaiting uh, approval for the for the heart failure group, the FMR group. Uh, and they expect to finish enrollment with that next year sometime. Um, this is just a quick slide just to show you that uh, the Pascal device has very similar outcomes uh, at two years as, as did the, uh, the Mitra clip. So I think both of those are very viable options. Um, quickly just touch on direct annuloplasty. We just mentioned that we want to have an annuloplasty option um, to, to mimic the surgeries. Um, the, the main device that's been available in Europe is this uh, cardio band. Um, and it is CE marked both for MR and TR. In the US, they, they had to uh, pause their clinical trial for MR and actually are, are currently working just on a TR device and their MR device is on hold. Um, other devices out there uh, include indirect annuloplasty. So this was a part of trial we, we were involved in with the NIH and uh, Emory and MedStar where we did this uh, mitral cerclage procedure. Basically, you take advantage of the fact that the coronary sinus runs around the mitral valve annulus. And so you can bring this. Um, device around the coronary sinus and then um, lock it down at the uh, tricuspid annulus and you can uh, you can actually cinch in the annulus itself just above the mitral valve which is where the coronary sinus sits and we saw considerable improvement in, in mitral regurgitation um, i don't really have time to get into the nuances here but essentially you go through the coronary sinus take a wire and perforate through the rv free wall snare it in the in the uh, outflow tract of the uh, rv externalize it and then 
drag the thing back around through the coronary sinus and there's a little bridging element that prevents you from obstructing the circumflex like you see there on the right. And you can basically tension it up and then relax it based on the mitral regurgitation. Um, there's another similar device out there called Carillon. The problem with Carillon is it didn't, uh, it doesn't have that bridging element, so it excluded a lot more patients. Um, you can see here, this is one of our patients. You can see in the, uh, I don't know if my, does my little pointer work? You can see here where the coronary sinus is tethered way in here, and you can see the mitral regurgitation has improved quite a bit. Um, another way to do this is the Carillon device. So you can see similar concept with this little bridging element within the coronary sinus, but the problem is it's, uh, with both these devices is the, the MR got better, but not nearly as good as, as MitraClip. And so both of them found that the uh, LVs actually reduced in size and there was improvement in heart failure. And so both of these studies are now moving on to, to basically uh, include um, heart failure patients rather than severe MR patients. So they're looking at um, a different population. Very similarly is this indirect annuloplasty from below. This is the AccuSense device. We were part of the early feasibility studies with this device. This goes in transfemorally across the aortic valve with a 24 inch sheath in the groin and basically drops a series of anchors into the free wall of the left ventricle with the concept of reducing the, the load or stress on the LV free wall. And then um, through Laplace's law, decreasing um, the stress, which will uh, induce ultimately a biological response. And so what we've seen is even, even though you get this immediate reduction in, in volumes from the, from the anchors, um, down the road at one year, you see this continued biologic effect with, with further improvement in, in volume reductions. Um, in the EFS study, we looked at mitral regurgitation improvement, and we saw some mitral regurgitation improvement, but nowhere near as much as what we saw with improvement in heart failure in general. And so they've now moved on to a pivotal trial that's not looking at MR, but looking at, at heart failure with dilated left ventricles. In fact, in this study, we now have to do mitral clip first to get rid of the severe MR, and then we would enroll them into this trial for, um, for heart failure. Um, to mimic the surgical approaches of repairing the cords, as you saw earlier, now we have a percutaneous transeptal therapy for, for um, reattaching the, for degenerative mitral regurgitation, for reattaching the cords to the papillary muscles. This is a first-in-man study called the neocord, and so more to come on that one as well. Um, then another total different concept is, is let's extend the posterior leaflet out um, so that the anterior leaflet has something to coax to. And so there's two different devices, Path Moon and Polaris, that both have similar concepts with different deployment strategies, but both of these basically extend the posterior uh, leaflet out so that you can have something for the anterior leaflet to coapt against and, and reduce mitral regurgitation. Um, on the flip side, we have transcatheter mitral valve replacement, and there are numerous, numerous devices that have been tried. Not a lot of them have failed, a lot of them have iterated. Um, all of them kind of started, um, at least commercially, with some more basic concepts. So we knew TAVR works. We have very, very um, robust data on sapien valves in the aortic position. And so we started uh, using this in the mitral position initially transapically, and then we figured out we could do this transeptally. And so we started with valve and valve, so existing surgical mitral valves, and we now just put a sapien inside those, which works extremely well, fairly straightforward. Much more uh, complicated is doing a valve and ring. Um, these rings have many, many shapes and flavors that are beyond the scope of this discussion, but uh, it's a much more complicated um, procedure, especially when it comes to decision making. Um, but you can still get good results if you choose the right patient. Um, the FDA has approved both of these. Um, what the FDA has not approved is mitral and MAC, but we do quite a few of these here. Um, so these patients have, uh, again, severe mitral annular calcification and, and usually some combination of mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis. And that's an empty slide. Oh, there we go. The problem with doing this uh, mitral and MAC is that uh, you, you can very frequently induce um, LV alpha tract obstructions if you're not careful. And so in the early days, we saw a lot of these problems. And you can see here in this series of patients through the mitral trial, um, the patients that did develop LVMT obstruction essentially all died. So there's not a good bailout once you have this obstruction. So a lot of work has been done on imaging to try to predict who's going to be at risk for the LVMT obstruction. And um, some procedures have been developed to mitigate this, including the lampoon procedure, which we were a part of the uh, IDE. Uh, essentially where you lacerate. So when the surgeons put in the mitral valve, they, re, they, re, they resect the anterior leaflet, essentially. What we do is we uh, decide to open up the LVOT with a, a slit in the anterior leaflet that opens that up like a curtain. So then you can deploy a, a sapien valve in that MAC or ring and prevent obstruction. 
Um, this is just some, we've had quite a few cases. This is just one example. You can see the little slit in the middle of the mitral valve here where we open that up. And then what happens is when you put a valve in that splays, and now you can put a safe in, uh, in that mitral annular calcification safely. Um, moving on to dedicated devices, probably the one that earliest had the most robust data and actually is the only device that's CE marked in Europe is the Tendine valve. Um, it's an interesting valve, it works very well. The problem is it has to be deployed transapically. And I think we all know from the TAVR literature that transapical approach is not the best and not the most ideal. Um, they had at two years, they had 39% mortality and actually a 17% mortality even in 90 days related to transapical complications. The valve itself worked fine with no structural valve deteriorations and now they're ongoing with the, the summit trial, the pivotal trial, which has both a, a native and um, both a um, non-calcified and a MAC arm, mitral annular calcification arm. Uh, taking off of this concept of mitral and MAC and mitral and rings, um, Edward said, hey, well, maybe we can make this a little bit safer and, and actually have something to deploy into. Remember, this mitral valve is saddle shaped, not just a little circle. And so you, you, and you need calcium to, to deploy in an aortic valve. You also need calcium to deploy in a, in a mitral valve. So what if they don't have severe MAC? Can we put a docking system in and actually just deploy a regular old sapien valve that's been modified with a little skirt around it? So that's the concept here is you take this um, docking system that goes through a 29 French sheath transeptal. So this is one of our cases. We did three cases a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is a big 29 French sheath that comes across the septum, all done percutaneously. And then uh, you deploy this docking system that basically runs around the cords. And then within that docking system, you deploy the sapien valve. And uh, these patients do extremely well. The mitral regurgitation was completely obliterated. Um, no, no significant paravalve leaks. And uh, the patients feel great so far. Um, this is the study here, looking at basically uh, 250 patients in this single arm multicenter study. Early data showing that the mitral regurgitation is again, essentially completely gone as opposed to edge to edge repair where you're still left a lot of times with mild to moderate mitral regurgitation. Um, so the rest of these are, are sort of um, less well-established valves. So the Edwards has had um, multiple iterations, including the CardioQ and then the um, Evoke, and now they've moved on to this next iteration called the Evoke EOS valve, um, which is, again, a, it's a um, dedicated transcatheter mitral valve that's completely recapturable after deployment, and they're ongoing with their early feasibility study. Um, I think they're the only ones that are completely recapturable uh, as then you can deploy the entire valve and then still go ahead and recapture. Um, the rest of them, you, you're pretty committed. Um, this is the Intrepid valve from Medtronic. So we're just, we're just starting this study as well. Uh, we'll be in this hopefully uh, early next year. Uh, but this was a transapical device initially as many of them are. Now they've just recently iterated to the, to the transfemoral approach. This is the 38 day outcomes from their transfemoral procedure. Um, big sheath, 35 French. Uh, so actually I think it's 40 French initially and they just iterated to 35 and their goal is 29 French trans transfemoral venous uh, procedure. Um, so cut downs initially and then hopefully uh, with these next gen systems will be mostly percutaneous without cut downs. But again, you can see here a complete obliteration of the mitral regurgitation and, and substantial improvement in heart failure class. Um, a whole bunch of other devices out there that have early, you know, just smaller first in man uh, studies that we could talk about all day, but I just wanted to kind of touch on some of the, the sort of the largest studies to date. Um, the point is TMVR is not TAVR. So all of these trials, you know, we've been a part of several of these trials and getting patients into the studies is very difficult because there's they're a limited size. Um, there's usually only one or two sizes for each one of these valves. Um, and then you still have these risks of LVOT obstruction like we talked about earlier, but you, you can't just do a lampoon because these skirts uh, for the valves, the transcatheter dedicated valves would still get in the way. So that's not really the solution here. So we, we need to continue to make iterations to make the devices smaller. We also have problems with leaflet thrombosis that we need to work out. And then again, figure out mitigation of LVOT obstruction and management of paravalve leaks. So I, the bottom line is uh, here is the only real FDA approved uh, therapy for, for native mitral valves. Um, now 2A for both DMR and FMR. Um, now we, again, we have two devices, both the MitraClip and the, and the Pascal device from Edwards as of today. Um, but we need to figure out, and then we can talk about this in the discussion, lots of different 
remaining questions, including uh, what degree of residual mitral regurgitation is important? Is it better to replace it uh, or, or repair it? Is it actually better for a bad ventricle with FMR to functional mitral regurgitation that leave a little bit of MR or should we try to completely reduce it? Um, what's more durable? You know, are we gonna end up with a bunch of leaflet thrombosis with all these native devices? Um, or we have to put these patients who are sick and high risk on Coumadin for the rest of their lives? Um, if we do tier, you know, if we do a mitral clip, can we ever then do a transcatheter mitral valve if that fails? You know, there's a lot of questions out there and I think we can talk about that as a group. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Forrest. So last but not least in our panel, we have Dr. Eric Sarin. He is the section chief of adult cardiac surgery at Inova Fairfax, and he brings over 20 years of experience as a practicing cardiothoracic surgeon and a wealth of knowledge about minimally invasive and catheter-based techniques as well. Dr. Sarin will speak about the surgical approach to tricuspid regurgitation. Dr. Sarin, thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always nice uh, to join the group. Um, while I'm trying to get my screen share, I saw Dr. Shore just fired a question off uh, into the chat about um, heart team assessments prior to deciding on the therapy. And so I'll obviously let you know Jason and Keenan answer what's the practice for their uh, groups. But certainly at uh, INOVA, um, everyone who comes uh, is going to get a transcatheter therapy comes through our valve clinic. Um, and so they'll be seen by, um, there's three of us that do uh, cover the TAVR program, uh, and myself and two other surgeons, and then there's for the mitrals and the tricuspids, that's uh, all runs through me as, as the surgeon. So everybody gets a uh, multidisciplinary evaluation. I don't know, what, what's it like for you guys, Keenan? Yeah, same with us. Um, anybody who's getting uh, mitral or tricuspid valve surgery um, usually runs through me or one of my partners, and then uh, also runs through the valve clinic, and we jointly discuss before deciding anything. And then same thing with TAVR, all of our surgeons see that, and then all of our uh, structural cardiologists do that too. Uh, but it's it's very much a, uh, as you can see, just by Jason and I's talks, there are a lot of different ways to skin a cat with the mitral valve uh, and a lot of different opinions and, and not a lot of um, robust clinical data. And it's not a you know, an aortic valve, sort of a dumb valve, you replace it, that's the way you fix it. And mitral valves are repaired or replaced. And there's a fine line about when to make that decision. Um, and so it's much more of an art form in terms of decision making, the actual techniques are not hard. But I think the decision making is is mostly a cognitive sport. Jason, I assume you have a, a similar setup at Carillion? Yeah, so most of our patients will come through our valve clinic and then um, we'll do we'll do all the workup and to get the T's and casts done and try to figure out the diagnosis. And then we'll bring it to a multidisciplinary group where we meet with the surgeons and uh, and discuss the patients, um, both we'll review CTs, echoes, and, and kind of review everything. And they, they'll, I wish we had a system where we would see them at the same time. I know some places do that. Um, we're, we're still struggling to get that coordinated with our surgeons, but after 10 years, but uh, we make sure they, if, if it's more complicated, they always see them in the office. If it's straightforward, they just see them on the day of the cap. Yeah, we, we've had a similar problem about trying to, you know, to have everyone see them at the same time. It just, it, as the programs grow and the volumes are exploding, it just gets too hard to get everyone in the same place all at once. Yeah, we, we've experimented with that, but where we struggled is getting all the studies in the same day, and particularly with staffing shortages and whatnot, getting an echo and a CT and a cath all lined up on the same day can be challenging nowadays. Yeah, I would say, I mean, our, and again, our problem probably like you guys is that these patients so often are coming three or three and four hours, sometimes six hours away. And so you're, you know, you do your best to get the, the outside studies. And then usually on the day of, a, of the clinic visit in the office for the valve clinic, we get a CT scan if they need it for either aortic or, or mitral disease or now tricuspid disease too. And then uh, they'll come in for their cath and see a surgeon or we'll set up a surgeon separately if it's, if it's uh, too complicated. All right. Sounds good. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here effectively. All right.
right. Is that working? Great job. Look at that. First shot, too. All right. So um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, to talk about surgery for tricuspid regurgitation. Um, and, uh, you know, and hopefully then we can have a kind of a discussion about how that impacts uh, some of the uh, tricuspid therapies that uh, Jason was already uh, touching on. Um, so certainly over time, surgical thinking has evolved uh, when it comes to uh, tricuspid valve intervention. Um, you know, obviously, I think it's something that, you know, the cardiology literature is recognizing too, is that there is a, um, there is an importance there. Uh, you know, people have addressed it as the forgotten valve, but I don't think that's been the case for quite some time. Um, when we look at, you know, some of the, some of the studies, at least, that I think, you know, uh, most people are familiar with, but certainly what shaped a lot of, uh, our thought processes over the last 20 years in surgery. And we know that severe TR over time is bad. And so this is a paper, I think it was uh, a five-year follow-up from the Mayo Clinic, looking at uh, you know, retrospectively reviewing patients with echoes uh, and then grading um, out over time, you know, their outcomes related to the severity of their TR. And, uh, you know, obviously as the TR got worse and you see it in the, in the graph, uh, you know, the, uh, the patient's mortality uh, went up. And, um, one interesting finding was that the moderate and severe TR uh, patients had an increased mortality that was independent of their uh, pulmonary pressures, their EF, or even their right ventricular size and function. Um, and this is another similar paper, um, uh, just looking at a little more recent, just from uh, 2014, same idea, but just looking at the uh, correlating the effect of regurgitant orifice, you know, using a cutoff of 40 millimeters squared, uh, same sort of thing, over a 10-year follow-up correlating um, survival and uh, cardiac events. And once again, showing us that uh, severe TR is, uh, is a significant problem for patients over the long term. Um, one of the one interesting paper, at least, and this goes back, I want to say, to, yeah, 2005. This was a, a paper in the cardiac surgery literature that you know shaped some of our current guidelines that maybe you know based on some more recent papers we may be reevaluating. But it's the idea of you know so if everyone under, agrees that we should be addressing ser a severe TR, uh, what do we do with uh, TR of lesser severity? And this uh, particular paper was looking at patients um, who had no tricuspid regurgitation uh, or mild tricuspid regurgitation, but a severely dilated annulus at the time of surgery. And so with these patients, um, they were you know, randomized over time. This is a 12 year uh, study done by a single surgeon uh, looking at concomitant tricuspid regurgitation, again, in the absence of significant TR, uh, but in the presence of annular dilatation. And there was a suggestion that, you know, obviously that over time it, it decreased the um, incidence of uh, TR progression and actually also correlated with improved symptoms. Um, our most, our current guidelines from 2020, and, uh, and we can stop for a second, I'm going to ask Keenan to weigh in too about what his current practice is, but basically looking at patients, uh, if you're going to the operating room anyway, so it's a, you know, talking about a concomitant uh, operation, severe TR, we've, ex we, we've agreed is going to, needs an intervention or at least the discussion about an intervention. Uh, but to look at a patient, if you're going for another reason, usually it's with a mitral operation, but looking at moderate or greater uh, tricuspid regurgitation and then an annulus of uh, four centimeters or more, um, Keenan, uh, what do you think about, uh, I mean, obviously set aside the most recent results from the CTSN network, what were you doing prior to kind of a year ago when that data got published? Uh, I was doing it along these guidelines. I was yeah. pretty aggressive prior to that study. Yeah. I've backed off um and, and i if it's moderate and dilated i'll do it right sure but but i if it's moderate and not dilated i'm not nearly as aggressive right. and so and so and before we get i realize it's the two surgeons on the call and i think i saw maybe dr rich so before we start going too that far down a rabbit hole what we're talking about is you know and this is for me too up until about a year ago if i was operating on a patient uh, for another reason, and I saw a tricuspid annulus greater than four centimeters, even if they had mild or trace TR, I was pretty routinely uh, putting a ring on that, um, just based on kind of some of the historical data about the potential for progression. Uh, but I'll, I'll touch on the, the most more recent data we have uh, in a few minutes, which has kind of made me certainly rethink uh, what I'm doing now. Uh, but certainly, I still will. If someone has um, moderate uh, tricuspid regurgitation at the time of surgery, I'm going to address that. And then the one thing I always think about too is if someone has atrial fibrillation. Those are uh, patients that even if they if they have a mildly dilated annulus but no TR, I worry just about um, leaving that tricuspid annulus not supported over time if they continue in AFib. Um, so the principles of the th of surgical technique, again, we're talking just about repair, and you know this is the the lion's share of these is really related to annular dilatation. 
And so when you're looking at the tricuspid valve and on the left, you'll have what we would call the surgeon's view. So that's the view, you know, kind of top down looking through the right atrium. Uh, you're really dilating out um, in the direction of the right ventricular free wall. And so um, your reduction really, uh, the, and I don't know if this pointer works, but your reduction really has to come around the anterior and the posterior leaflets toward the septal leaflet, but that's where you're gonna have, uh, you know, your progression and dilatation. You can see it sort of on the intra-op picture where those arrows are. So that's, that's what we're trying to affect at the time of surgery. Um, a lot of historical techniques that have been described but have now kind of been, you know, put on the trash heap um, just because they weren't effective in complete in giving you a complete reduction, um, uh, one, at the time of surgery, but then two, sustained over time. And so what the gold standard is now is what you see at the bottom center of this slide, and that's the... Uh, the, an incomplete uh, annuloplasty ring uh, that was uh, you know, uh, designed by uh, Dr. Carpentier in the early 70s. And what's notable here, obviously, you know, we talk about, and Keenan touched on a little bit about the choice when you're on the mitral side about an incomplete, you know, or a complete ring and flexible versus, uh, you know, rigid. Uh, there are no complete rings for the tricuspid and for good reason, because we're trying to spare the uh, AV node. Uh, you know, you don't, obviously don't want to fire stitches in that kind of six to nine o'clock region because uh, you can give somebody a heart block. Sorry. All right. So then moving forward, and then this is just a, this is a, a really nice study from the uh, Cleveland Clinic um, where they looked at the results over time of, you know, uh, different, these varying kind of uh, approaches. And this is what really, I think, among other experiences, really sort of settled the idea that you need to be using a, um, a rigid ring, uh, incomplete annuloplasty ring, because there's a high, high incidence of recurrence with all of these uh, other, other techniques. Um, the rigid rings, at least the two most commonly, the ones that we use sort of here at INOVA in particular, uh, kind of it's whether you can choose whether it's Edwards or Medtronic. Um, I don't necessarily feel like there's a huge difference between either one, um, you know, uh, the one, one sort of, you know, they all have a pretty consistent build. You see, they all have this kind of gap at the uh, kind of in the six to nine window uh, because you're not going to put stitches by the AV node. One interesting, you know, uh, component here is you see this is the Medtronic, uh, it's a triad ring, which honestly I actually don't use that often, but it has a flexible and a rigid component. So you can kind of tailor how far around you want to bring your stitches. Um, again, as I said, the, uh, the, when you're talking about the technical considerations for your annuloplasty, uh, first and foremost, you want to avoid the conduction system. The other thing, from a surgical standpoint, uh, the tricuspid annulus is pretty flimsy, uh, especially in comparison to the mitral annulus. Um, so you have to be pretty careful with your stitches. Um, you can use, I will tend to use overlapping sutures, and I'm always very careful about when you pull up and put tension on them. Certainly, if you have a, an, an assistant in the OR with you who's not very experienced, you want to prevent them from pulling up too hard because it can rip, uh, rip, rip right through that muscle. Um, and then, so this is something that I'm sort of borrowing from Steve Bowling, who's a well-known mitral tricuspid surgeon at the University of Michigan. But, you know, his mantra for uh, residents, and maybe it's, it's at UVA too, Keenan, I don't know, but basically 10 stitches that you take you 10 minutes and you go from 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And so it should be pretty reproducible. And you can see the uh, operative picture of the ring after it's been uh, tied, uh, sewn into place on the right. And again, you can see that, you know, a lot of respect given to that uh, area of the uh, conduction system. So uh, nice big wide open spot there. So another consideration is always about sizing. And again, this is from Dr. Bowling. Um, you know, I used to kind of get a little more in, in, in my head about how I would size a valve, but that now recently, I think there's really, there's very little downside to being aggressive when you downsize. And I think uh, I, I haven't put a valve, a ring, an annual plastic ring on a tricuspid that's been, you know, larger than 30 uh, millimeters for probably the last several years. Um, so uh, in terms of what, what we need, this is, up in, this is a year ago, what we needed was um, you know, some more robust clinical outcome data about, you know, to shape our practice. And that's where the uh, CTS uh, network, um, you know, the, uh, trial came in. So this uh, is obviously, it's a uh, multi-institutional NIH-sponsored uh, cardiac surgery research consortium, you know, that involves, the, it's in the United States as well as Canada and actually also in Europe. Uh, and they, they saw, they uh, proposed the question of looking at patients uh, who had a degenerative mitral valve regurgitation, and had moderate tricuspid regurgitation or none or mild tricuspid regurgitation with a dilated annulus at the time of surgery. Um, and, uh, you know, was going to investigate the effects of concomitant tricuspid valve repair. 
Um, they randomized patients to uh, annuloplasty. They received either a 26, a 28, or a 30 millimeter ring. So only small rings. So some of our attempts at you know valve repair uh, studies in the past, there's always been this complaint that you know people didn't aggressively downsize enough. So they were not. You were you had to give you know, choose a, one of these three sizes for your ring. Um, it was a pretty mixed population, as these patients often sometimes are. So concomitant procedures were done in over 50% of the patients. Uh, so whether that was a coronary bypass operation or a maze procedure, I actually, I think it was about 44% of the patients actually had AFib at the time of surgery. Uh, and then the primary endpoint was a composite of uh, reoperation for progression of the tricuspid regurgitation, uh, increase of the tricuspid regurgitation uh, by two grades, uh, the pre presence of severe TR or depth. And so the uh, two-year data was published just about a year ago now, it was in November. And so what they found was that in the patients who had a tricuspid um, annuloplasty at the time of surgery, uh, they had a lower incidence of the uh, primary endpoint. Now, the primary endpoint was entirely driven by uh, increase in TR. So uh, the deaths were the same in the group. Um, there were no reoperations uh, in, in both groups for uh, you know uh, symptomatic TR, but it really was a progression of tricuspid regurgitation over those two years and the patients who did not have an annual plastic. Um, but kind of one of the more striking things, and certainly something that stole, I think, a lot of the thunder when the uh, data was presented, was the um, increased pacemaker uh, implantation rate for patients uh, who had the tricuspid annuloplasty at, at the time of surgery. So 14% uh, of those patients in the uh, uh, tricuspid arm um, ended up with a pacemaker. What's interesting is that the majority of them were placed in the first two days after surgery, which to me is obviously, I think, pretty fast. I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty slow to pull the trigger on a pacemaker, uh, certainly at our institution. Uh, but this got a lot of attention, and rightfully so, because as you know, we've, we've recognized over time that a pacemaker is not necessarily a benign thing. And I think, as you know, Keenan alluded to a few moments ago, I think it's caused a lot of us to reevaluate, you know, uh, how aggressive we are for someone who does not have severe tricuspid regurgitation um, uh, or, or or moderate tricuspid regurgitation, and we're only treating a dilated annulus. So um, in, in kind of conclusion for that trial, that uh, con the uh, concomitant repair of the tricuspid valve at the time of surgery did decrease the progression of severe TR over, over the two-year follow-up, but there was an increased need for pace, uh, permanent pacemaker implantation. Essentially, you had to treat, I think it was 20 patients um, with, with the tricuspid repair, 20 patients to um, kind of effectively, uh, you know, help one from pro uh, progressing to severe TR, and it was at the expense of two patients getting a pacemaker over two years. Um, at the uh, interesting also in their follow-up, severe TR was not associated with a meaningful uh, difference in their clinical systems or quality of life at two years. Now that needs there's continued follow-up associated with this study, so it'll be interesting to see how those patients do over time. Because certainly there's a wealth of literature uh, historically that shows that it's not something pe people tolerate well for long. Um, and as I said, long-term follow-up is ongoing, um, and it really has, I think, you know, especially for people who do a lot of mitral and tricuspid surgery, uh, has called us, you know, the question uh, the utility of a tricuspid annuloplasty in patients who do not have uh, tricuspid regurgitation at the time of surgery. Uh, and that's that's it. I think the irony of that is that uh, your your delta there with pacemaker is going to more than compensate for the delta with tricuspid regurgitation because these patients that get Pacemaker leads are going to end up with TR 10 years from now. <laughs> so they're all going to go back to having TR from their pacers. Right. Get a micro. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great, that's a great solution. Just need them to be able to sense the atrium better. <laughs> hey, Eric, this is Alan Spear. That was a, uh, thank you for that uh, great presentation. The, the one question I had, was there anything said in the GAMI study about the increased mortality uh, for reoperation for tricuspid regurgitation. Um, there was uh, for some years uh, the, the data that supported an increased mortality for TR if it, it you hadn't repaired it at the time of the mitral procedure. And it was uh, up to 20% uh, or more. Uh, was anything said about that? 
No, uh, because it was a, it was a only a two year follow up that's being reported so far. And at that two year follow up, um, none of the patients in either group had required a reoperation, even for the ones who had the progression to severe, severe TR, they, none of them had required reoperation. I, I expect as they continue to follow the cohort out, you're going to find the severe TR patients becoming more symptomatic, you're going to find re intervention uh, more frequent, and then, uh, you know, we'll start to answer the questions, you know, look like what you asked, and then obviously the other ones. Yeah, I agree. I think we'll see that more in the five and 10 year data as this gets borne out. The one thing that's different about sort of prior studies looking at that is that we do have, um, I guess Paul's not going to give this talk, but we do have better transcatheter solutions for the recurrent TR uh, than we did a decade ago. They're still in their infancy, but at least it may spare people a, a second surgery. Yeah, that's basically a, an entire uh, session in itself. It's just tricuspid therapies. Um, you know, I think the problem with a lot of the tricuspid valve replacements is still the same, though, to your points that uh, when you have pressure on that uh, septum there, and that's why you have these rings that, that, that span the septum or, or put the gap in the septum, is you end up with a lot of pacemaker dependency when you put these valves. We even see that in some of the... Uh, like the cerclage trial, we saw we saw increased pacemaker rates when we were really pinching down on that part of the septum. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what class TR and the in the mitroclip TR trial look like in, in terms of uh, final outcomes. So we're part of that study as well. I think that we are at the point of our present, well, meeting where we can open a floor for any questions and start the panel discussions. Uh, we wanted to be sure that we left time for to be able to call upon our experts and pick their brains and put them on a the spot a little bit. So if you have any questions you would like to pose, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask those questions. Don't be shy. We'll say, I don't know what you guys are doing in terms of your tricuspid patients, but uh, just recently in the last couple of months, we've done a bunch of uh, tricuspid valve and valve and valve and ring patients. Um, as always, valve and ring is, is a little bit tricky. This one patient had a uh, pacemaker, permanent pacemaker lead, and I was worried about crushing the lead. And so we actually did, I had him put in a micro just in case we crushed the lead and fractured it. Um, and then we, then we put in the valve. Um, so a lot of different uh, nuances to how we do these valve and rings with the tricuspid compared to the mitral. Yeah, surgically I'll trap it a lot if I'm replacing, or or have it exchanged for a micro ahead of time. Yeah, I I I, I would sort I'll do the same thing, and then um, just a question about the transcatheter stuff. We've had good results with uh, for valve and valve patients who've had a tricuspid valve replacement, and you know we've had done a few valve and rings, um, and I would say that they are highly variable in terms of you know the clinical outcome and, and the benefit. I mean, I, I, one comes to mind that went very well, and then probably you know one or two where it looked fine, and then the, but it wasn't a sustained result. Yeah, what happens is you get a big leak over in that spot where you don't have a ring. <laughs> so Emory's developed a thing called Tootsie Roll. So what you do is you um, you put basically a, uh, a Gore-Tex graft in over on that side. You deploy your valve, and then you deploy your, your Gore-Tex graft to fill in the space. And then you put a uh, an ASD device inside the graft to, to seal off that flow. Um, so lots of creative ways out there to solve some of these problems. And Sherry, you had, or we had had a few cases they had me put together just to sort of illustrate some of these points. I didn't know if we want to do that or not. I'm actually finding this very fascinating. So if you wouldn't mind, yes, please. All right. Do you have that presentation? 
think we'll need you to share your screen yeah. here. Yes, thank you. You're more ambitious than me with 56 slides. Sorry, Ken, I think you're muted. Perfect. Uh, well, these slides will go very quick, so <laughs> I promise that. They're all echoes. Uh, just a few disclosures for me. I forgot to mention this on the initial one, but I have <laughs> consultant for Edwards and Medtronic. Uh, so first case, uh, I brought in a 82 year old female, uh, overall in decently good health, uh, sort of new onset AF that uh, prompted the, the discovery of her mitral regurgitation. Uh, did have a total left hip replacement one year ago. And uh, otherwise, just some mild asthma, uh, decently reduced FEV1. But not a prior smoker or anything, and no uh, coronary disease on her cat. Uh, her age mostly drives her uh, STS score, 4.5%, uh, so sort of squarely in the intermediate range. Um, and you can see there sort of classic anterior jet, um, decent biventricular function. Here's the TEE showing that um, sort of classic P2 flail, again, an anterior directed jet. And uh, here's the 3D, and you can actually even see the cord. Uh, I have my arrow pointing to it. You can actually see the cord uh, flapping in the breeze there uh, on the 3D echo. So I was just going to put this out to the uh, panel um, to see you know, you, this sort of sort of classic case of somebody who will walk into your office with fairly typical age range, what people would do uh, nowadays for this sort of patient. And then I don't know if we have voting ability, Sherry, but we can open it up to the whole, the panel or the whole group. Hey, Keenan, was she subjectively frail to you? No, but she had got, undergone a hip replacement for a hip fracture one year before, which always gives me uh you know, right. still getting around, but you know, that slows people down. Right. So I, I you know, obviously we see these patients all the time in the valve clinic and, and I, I tell them all, I'm very open and honest about my opinions on, on transcatheter edge to edge repair technology versus surgery. And I, you know, I think surgery for this particular patient is very, very good if you can repair that. Um, and so what I tell them is basically if the surgeon thinks they can get you through the surgery safely and, and well, then we should accept that fact. If you're 82, but up and moving, many good mitral surgeons can get you through this very quickly. And, 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 you know, you, you may be home within three to five days. Um, and you may, you may have to bite the bullet for a month or so and feel a little bit rough, but if you're a robust 82 year old, you may be looking at another uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, but if the surgeon says that you're no good uh, for surgery and that they're worried about your recovery, then certainly I think this is a very reasonable mitra clip or edge to edge repair case. Yeah, well, and it's funny because sometimes it's depending, if, especially if they're borderline, and I'll look at someone like this, and you know, that looks pretty straightforward to me for, uh, for tier. And so when patients like that, especially if I'm on the fence or they're kind of, you know, in you know, a bit of a higher risk category or have some subjective frailty scores, 
if it's something like that where I'm, I look at it and say that's going to be a really they'll get a really nice result with the clip, then that's something that may sway me in that direction versus someone if they have, you know, pathology that's maybe more commissural, like up towards P3, A3, where it's maybe not quite as consistent, you know, as a result with tear. I may then, you know, that's that at least is part of the discussion with them about um, maybe choosing surgery, even if they have a little bit of a higher risk. There's obviously a couple other measurements we need to make sure that they were good, but I mean, there isn't anything terribly abnormal about that valve. I actually get a CT on a lot of these patients too, just look for a concomitant MAC that we may not see totally, and then um, for valve areas. Uh, Eric, or do you do this uh, through a sternotomy or through an uh, anterior thoracotomy approach? The only question I would have is the severity of the AI. So if it's truly just mild, then I would do this as a mini, no problem, and do a full maze and clip the appendage through the transverse sinus and, and ring the tricuspid if it was indicated. I think I saw moderate, but um, hey, yeah, the AI would be the only thing because then I worry about protection. And obviously, if it's bordering on moderate, then I would talk to them about you know getting everything fixed. Well, I can give the outcome here. Um... Let's see. So I tried to actually get her into the primary trial to compare clip versus surgery. Uh, and she just did not like the idea of a coin flip making that decision. Um, but I, I just sort of thought she was, you know, classically intermediate risk, 82, you know, probably perfect. You know, they, I, you, you just saw you got a, a mixed bag of answers that there's no right, not right or wrong answer here. Uh, so she ended up choosing surgery and I did this through a mini thoracotomy I, I was worried about her AI too and it, it turned out um, that protection was no issue um, and I left the tricuspid alone I left the AFib alone uh, and just sort of got in and out she her creatinine was a little elevated like 1.8 and so I just sort of felt like I would go for the high and, and it was just one episode of AFib um, and that was sort of the interoperative pathology. But you can see I used a band, flexible band there. And that sort of shows you where I resected. Um, but relatively small valve and post-op there. But I, again, I think clip probably could have been a good result for her too. I have to say, with the crayon in the 1.8, I think, I, don't, I mean, I can't speak for our surgeons completely, but I think they may have tended at 82 to lean towards clip with that. Yeah. Oh, and here it was the patient just sort of, you know, again, she's not prohibitive risk. So it sort of limited her options a little bit, but I would have been okay had she full, discl full disclosure, we do about 40 clips a year. So I'm pretty uh, discriminant about who we do clips on. <laughs> we do 250 tappers a year. So <laughs> yeah. and just and just for the record, with a creatinine of one eight, I probably would have done what you did. A single episode AFib, I would have gotten in and gotten out of there. And I, I would not have spent much time worrying about the tricuspid. Yeah. Yeah. If she were in her 60s, I definitely would have felt differently about things. Um case two. So this one, 77-year-old female. Uh I actually saw this one recently. Hypertension, former smoker, had PAD on her uh, CT scan, but no claudication, uh, prior history of successfully treated stage three colon cancer, has had a carotid endarterectomy, uh, and mildly reduced PFTs, no CAD, uh, came in again with this general dyspnea exertion, and she's a little bit older. I'm just going to put up some representative pictures of her CT scan. You can see a lot of arch calcium, uh, no ascending calcium, but you can look at her lungs. They're not normal, but they're not horrible. Uh, and then just sort of some CT pictures of her, uh, of her mitral annulus. Good idea of the calcium burden. And just in terms of peripheral cannulation, so you can look at her femoral arteries there. They're certainly easy enough to cannulate, about six and a half millimeters by measurement, but does have a decent amount of plaque in her uh, distal ascending. So here's the TE, and at first pass, I think you see the MAC and the elevated posterior leaflet. It certainly goes high. And then it sort of raised my eyebrow is this image right here. I think you can start to appreciate the amount of calcium on that leaflet itself uh, on a 77-year-old. And uh, 
there's sort of another representative image. And you can see the mechanism, it, it's central and uh, anterior directed. It, it's not exactly just sort of a straight anterior jet. And then perhaps this shows it a little bit more clearly, but you can see that jet sort of on the P3 side of P2 where it's prolapsing up, but then it looks like uh, over farther into P3 is almost like a cleft. And then there's the interpretation from the T, the official interpretation. So put a couple of different options here, uh, <laughs> but surgical repair, uh, surgical replacement, uh, transcatheter edge to edge or transcatheter replacement. Uh, and I, I put it up to the, the whole group uh, for this one. I'm not loving this for tear. I'll tell you that. Yeah. yeah. I don't like clefts. I mean, this is, and I know you don't like Mac uh, posteriorly for sure. Um, so I, I'm i tending towards one of the uh, TMBR trials. I know you guys have quite a few of them. Uh, one of them being Tendine, which has a nice Mac arm. Um, you were one of the leaders in the Mac arm, as I understand it. So I think that'd be a reasonable option. Oh, I saw the voting. Sorry. Don't let me sway you. No, no, I'm so sorry. I hit the button by mistake, but I'll launch it. <laughs> I would say, you know, just maybe why that vote's going through, you know, Keenan, I like you. One of the things that would concern me that the, the Mac is always something we obviously pay a lot of attention to, but that that thickened posterior leaflet, the calcification in it, I would worry about the durability of a repair. Like even if you could get cords to pull it down, I would be a little nervous about doing, I mean, you, you don't know until you see it, but to try and do any resection on that, I would be a little concerned about my suture line trying to close, bring that tissue back together. And then when a posterior leaflet's that stiff over time, I feel like the, it doesn't obey the cords. You know what I mean? Like you have to either really, really pull it so it's just a sheet going straight down. But if you leave any mobility, those are ones that I've seen where I get recurrence over time and I always kind of kick myself. So I agree. I mean, with everything else, if I, to me, this would be a great one to put into a, into a transcatheter mitral valve replacement trial. That's certainly what we would probably try to do with uh, this patient at Fairfax. Yeah. And, and all of what you just said uh, sort of informed my decision making, um, you know, clearly not a clip candidate with that amount of calcium um, or a cleft and and so the reluctancy there, I certainly didn't feel like I could uh, offer her a uh, confident repair with that amount of leaflet calcium. I'll work around a spicule of MAC. I won't work around MAC on the whole posterior annulus, but I'm fine just sort of skipping an annuloplasty suture there or just going around it. Uh, but it, when it's like that, it's that diffuse. I, I agree with you, Eric. I, I think it's just going to fail. And, uh, and so they're heading for a replacement and age 77 with, you know, sort of moderate comorbidities, I'm very much fine uh, enrolling in a transcatheter replacement trial. Interestingly, she's going through the screening processes and uh, LVOT um, outflow trial. Yeah. Probably gonna have to get in the blade. <laughs> this is the, yeah, this is the problem with, with these patients that have MAC is they almost always have small LVOTs. Yeah. So, you know, we've got several options for that, just for the audience purposes. Um, we have alcohol septal ablation is sort of the most crude and long standing option. Um, but with alcohol septal ablation comes a nearly 50% risk of heart block requiring a pacemaker, um, depending on which center. But uh, I think that's most of us that do it a lot. We've seen as much as 50% pacemaker rates. Um, including Emory and, and Washington, University of Washington, which do all of us do a ton of these. Um, so some other novel therapies, again, Lampoon's not gonna work for these dedicated TMBR devices. Um, the other novel therapy um, that, that we're working on iterating is this sesame procedure where we actually take a wire and, and percutaneously lacerate the septum um, so Emory's now done, I think, almost 20 of these things, including multiple live cases, where you where you mimic the original Moreau myotomy procedure by by uh, uh, penetrating the the cap of the of that septal knuckle, and then it, it's amazing how the wire just sort of slides right through the middle of the knuckle, and you 
with ultrasound guidance can can pull it out the other end of the knuckle and then snare it and then make a nice myotomy, which basically forms a little uh, fillet uh, of the uh, of the uh, septal knuckle. And if you watch on CT over the following months, it looks very similar to to both a surgical myectomy and an alcohol septal ablation, probably better than a sur um, um, alcohol septal ablation with less pacemaker dependency. Um, our one case we did, we ended up having an echo problem and ended up with a membranous septal BSD that the, uh, the UVA guys actually helped me out with when the congenital surgeons fixed it. But, uh, but the, the results from Emory are actually really outstanding and maybe a, a future option for, for these patients as a predecessor to doing the TMBR. And also interestingly for diastolic dysfunction, we've seen a lot of improvement with that. Well, so for her, it sounds like we're all in agreement and, you know, it's sort of interesting how different centers come to the same conclusions. Um, go to the next case. So here's another one, 74 year old male known mitral valve prolapse for many years with mild MR and recently progressed. Um, pretty active guy, uh, but not as active as he once was. Um, interestingly, BMI of 16, which caught my attention. Uh, he was only 115 pounds, and it was not necessarily intentional uh, weight loss, but cancer workup was negative. Um, otherwise, nothing else major about him. So he's 74, and then I'll show the um, transthoracic echo, not the greatest qualities, but I think you can appreciate sort of bileaflet prolapse um, and a fairly dilated annulus out to 42 millimeters. And uh, there you go, sort of on the transesophageal, I think you can see very much a bileaflet mechanism, uh, but worse at P2. And, and again, it's sort of more, perhaps more anteriorly directed jet. Um, and then there you go is the 3D. Um, and it probably shows that, that there is a little bit of a flail at P2, but very much, in my opinion, a Barlow's valve. And uh, this guy came to my office with the opinion, surgery, no way. Um, and there's the T interpretation. So <clears throat> there are some options there that I, I just threw up. Um, Barlow's valve, um, Jason or Eric, if y'all want to. Yeah, this is this is now looking like our official mitral clip patient. <laughs> so he sounds pretty pretty damn frail. Um, I mean, I guess the first question is, should he have anything done when he's that frail? Um, I, I think we could probably he's he's probably too sick for a TMBR trial. I wouldn't want this guy in my trial anyway. So I think it'd be worth trying edge to edge repair. It's going to take multiple clips, but I think this is probably a reasonable if if anything. Uh, edge to edge repair kind of guy. Um, it's got a big annulus, so there's plenty of space. You would end up with two or three clips. Um, but I, I mean, I think the big question is that or nothing. Yeah, I, I would certainly say in, in the face of significant frailty, I, I wouldn't be pushing for anything other than a, than a clip if, if provided it was anatomically uh, feasible. Yeah, and, and so our team, um, you know, with Barlow's, they just have a lot of hesitancy on that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm i just going to go back here to the, I think this one probably shows it the best. But, you know, to me, it's almost always a disease of annular instability more so than leaflet instability with Barlow's. Um, and so I, I'm always a little less um, enthusiastic about CLIP in these settings. I don't think those leaflets are very thick, but it looks oh, right. thin. That's, yeah, but to me, I, I just think the disease is almost more easily treated with annuloplasty, uh, and often that alone solves yeah. it. Um, so, you know, we had the same sort of debate, and so he's turned on for, by my Club team, and, um, and ultimately, I felt he was good enough to make it through but there's no doubt i had my concerns um and it was a pretty quick in and quick out repair um i don't always use a ring but i will use a complete ring on barlow's 
uh, and his was quite large despite that BMI 42 ring. And that honestly solved almost everything and except at this small triangular section of P2. Sometimes instead in Barlow, as like I said at the first talk, I'll just Alfieri A2 and P2 and do a ring and call it call it there. Uh, but usually just a large ring in and of itself solves the issue. Uh, and, and that's sort of the, the classic picture there, the P2 resection with the full ring around it. Um, here's the next one. How long did that guy stay in the hospital and, when, and how's he doing it one year or one month? Uh, <laughs> he is uh, about two months out now, spent about uh, 12 days in the hospital because he was so hypoalbuminemic that his uh, yeah. nearest chest tube output took a while to dry up uh, and still has an effusion. So I don't think it was easy on him, even though it was minimally invasive. Um, but I, you know, again, like you said, the option I didn't have up there was to do nothing. Uh, case for 74 year old or 71 year old female. <laughs> Sixteen to wasn't low enough. BMI of fourteen. Okay, good. Yeah, exactly. And this <laughs> one, this one is sort of along the um, tricuspid pathway. Um, yeah, so came to my clinic with a BMI of fourteen and set all of seventy six pounds. Traveled four hours away to get to me, and told me she wanted to feel better and she definitely didn't want surgery and I didn't really care to offer it to be honest. Uh, but torrential TR. And um, I think you can sort of see it there. They're like two separate jets um, to it. And perhaps a 3D view there. Sorry, it's so small on my screen. Uh, but you can see sort of anterior and septal both prolapsing. Very dilated annulus. So... <clears throat> I know Paul didn't get to give his talk on percutaneous tricuspid therapies, but um, I guess any thoughts to surgery, transcatheter repair, just going ahead and calling it a replacement? With isolated tricuspid pathology. Again, my first my first concern for a clinical trial is just the BMI. And like, is this patient even a good candidate for a clinical trial? You don't want to ruin the clinical trial by putting somebody in that's just too frail or too sick. Um, so that's that's one of my biggest concerns. I think wholly out, wholly out front, but um, in terms of transcatheter um, edge to edge repair, you know, with CLASP TR or the MitraClip trial, then uh, you would have to see a few more pictures. Yeah. I take it, Eric, you're not eager to operate. Uh, absolutely not. This is something <laughs> where I would I would basically have our structural guys look at it and I'd say, look, you got you have to come up with something. Uh, yeah. because yeah, I would I would not be uh, interested in operating at all. Yeah. And I um I, I threw this uh, Scott Lem's direction and he got a beautiful result. Um did two clips, um, one septal anterior and the other septal posterior. Um, I, I actually wanted her to get uh, in the Cardioband Prime trial, um, but um, her BMI sort of excluded it, as Jason alluded to. Uh, but he got trace TR with a, pretty much no mean gradient across it, so a really good result. And uh, there's sort of the short axis image on TE, but you can see um, I, I was sort of suspect that it would work, and it worked beautifully. So it turns out for all Eric and I can do, somebody can just come along with a big honking clip and um, and achieve sometimes a pretty darn good result. Um, An unusually good result for a tricuspid clip, but yes. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, here, I know we're sort of, well, actually we're doing okay on time. Um, sort of a fifth case, 75-year-old um, uh, male, severe mitral regurgitation, uh, feeling pretty sick, but actually a pretty robust guy, uh, former smoker, has some asbestosis, a um, little obese, but sort of Virginia standard, uh, severe pulmonary hypertension, and estimated PA pressure is sort of right around 100, uh, with a pretty moderately down right ventricle, uh, also had sort of this big hepatic steatosis, it had prior ERCPs, 
but overall, you know, passes the eyeball test enough. Uh, SDS calculates out to 3%. Uh, mechanism, severe posterior prolapse with the anteriorly directed jet, and then mild TR, mild AI. And I'll show, oh, of course, sorry, I think the Mac to Windows to Mac transition didn't, uh, isn't letting this play. Let me see. Not going to let this one play either. Well, <laughs> hold on, maybe it will. All right, well, you get a 3D. Um, so you see that. Sort of on the P1 side of P2 flail segment there. Um, so a fairly focal mechanism, fairly, um, you know, I'd say squarely intermediate, uh, if not high risk, perhaps with that pulmonary hypertension uh, and lung disease, but sort of curious where everybody would fall on someone like this, perhaps a little bit younger than that 82 year old. Uh, that we talked about earlier, but perhaps a little bit sicker. For me, it looks like a reasonable edge to edge repair case for sure. Depending on what the mitral valve area is, there I can tell. Yeah, again, if for me, if it's somebody who you know, again, it would come down to subjectively what I think, because at that age, I would, I would really. Not be hard pressed, but I would if I was going to pass on surgery because that looks like a pretty repairable valve. Uh, I would have to be uh, kind of swayed just by, by the subjective, you know, slash objective uh, eyeball test. So uh, agreed and considered him for trials. I thought he'd be probably a pretty good candidate for the repair MR trial, and uh, in any case, uh, didn't go that direction. He ultimately ended up with clip. Uh, Ended up surprisingly taking yeah. three clips, and you know this is sort of always where, where when the clip doesn't always go well, or you got to get up to three or four clips to solve it, um, it makes you wonder. They ended up leaving with a mean gradient of six uh, at a pretty reasonable heart rate. Uh, didn't need to close the ASD at all or anything. Uh, and at first, the guy felt great for the first few weeks, um, and of course. Sorry, the uh, sorry, the echoes on this particular case aren't playing. I don't know what happened, uh, but you can. It looked good on this echo and mean gradient of six. So he's discharged with mild MR, feeling better, but then uh, comes back two weeks later in heart failure, new onset AFib, uh, and not previously had AFib. And pretty impressive right heart cath, and then a mitral gradient of 19 uh, at a heart rate of 65, uh, presumably from the three clips. And then now um, concerned that one of the clips had torn uh, at A1P1, and he's got so he's got now severe MR and severe MS, um, and continued shunning across his ASD. So. <laughs> And, you know, it just sort of shows you where the Achilles heel are, heels are if you go a certain direction and then you know, you're left with surgery at this point is really the only recourse. Um, yeah, this is actually why I'm somewhat hesitant. I mean, believe me, I'm, this is what I do for a living, but I, I definitely have a, a higher threshold to do a mitra clip just because of these kind of problems. And so I, this is yeah. where I think CMDR is going to have a role for sure down the road. Right. Um, if you just had a single clip on here. Um, you know, there's a couple of different points to make here. Number one is if you just had a single clip on here, one of the options is is to lacerate percutaneously. It's a procedure called elastica, where you lacerate percutaneously, similar to what you would do with lampoon, but you come across the uh, and you can actually get rid of the clip. You can cut the clip off one of the leaflets, and then you can go ahead and do your TMBR. And then the other option here is. Um, if you had just, let's say there was just a leak in between two clips or way over in a corner, one of the things I've done is take a cardioform and put it inside uh, that leak. And we've had some pretty amazing results with, with using the cardioform to plug leaks. In this case, that's, that's not an option for either one of those. Obviously, we have only option here really is surgery. Yeah. And then, uh, 
have some votes again, but dealing with this sort of patient, um, sternotomy or minimally invasive when you're trying to get three clips off. Uh, and then are you going to repair or replace Eric or other surgeons on the call? Sort of curious what you'd choose for either of those. Uh, and then what to do about the now new severe TR and do you just chalk that up to a bad mitral valve now since it was previously only mild and not dilated? And then do you address his new onset AFib um, when you're in there? Yeah, I would I would definitely do this as a sternotomy. Um, just more about the guy's acuity. I mean, I've, I've done minimally invasive approaches for failed clips, but these were on patients that were a little bit more stable. I think this guy, you know, is obviously not doing well. So just in order to move quickly, I would do a sternotomy um, and yeah, go right right to replacement. Um, I don't know. Even though this is sort of a relatively short failure. I think if it was one clip, you know what I mean? Like to try and repair that valve, like, because if you can kind of, you know, you can feather them off, but with three clips in there and the guy being pretty acute, I wouldn't mess around. I would go right to replacement. I would bring the the tricuspid um, just again, I, I feel like this it's progressed. Um, so I would address that also. And then uh, the AFib thing, I think, um, you know, I would, I would certainly consider it at the very least. I would definitely manage his appendage. Uh, but again, just based on the guy's acuity, I don't know if I would put the extra time into a, for, for a full maze, even though it's not that much extra time, but I probably, that would, be, that would be the first thing to go on my list. Yeah, I, um, uh, pretty much right down the line is what I did there. I, I went through a sternotomy, did not even consider a minimally invasive approach here. Um, and then, um. Uh, I, I did end up addressing his TR uh, and did end up managing his appendage uh, and not doing any further ablation. Uh, How are you guys I, doing with the appendage? Are you doing atriclip? Are you resecting primarily or what are you doing? No, oh, atriclip, uh, for sure. I, I, don't, I don't do it uh, any other way. Irv used to oversew it from the inside uh, and Alawati would too sometimes, but I'd say most of me and my partners use Atria Club. What about you guys? I tend to, so in a case like this, again, a lot of stuff going on. I'm trying to move fast. I would probably, I would consider an Atria Club. I'm sort of a holdout. I like to amputate it and over sew it from the outside, but it's more just to show everyone that it can be done kind of thing. I, I will sort of say it's to save money. But in a in a guy like this, I, a clip is probably, this is probably a case where I would use a clip just to move fast. And also not to have to worry about it potentially bleeding at the end. Fair. Um, with this one, uh, for whatever reason, I was under a lot of pressure to repair it based on who the patient was and et cetera. Uh, and so I, I did end up uh, practicing the night before with the Abbott rep on how to get these things off. And the only miracle here was that it was only two weeks out so not a lot of scar formation but i pretty much had to attach a1 and p1 back to the annulus and then sort of alfie area there uh and then resected the diseased leaflet and did a full ring um but i had uh i'll say i had a lot of partners and outside opinion that totally agreed with just replacement here it was very reasonable uh and it's probably what i would have done myself without some outside pressure um and uh it won't won't play but it was a pretty decent result um and i was just gonna sort of to get back to dr core's question at the end but you know i think as you can see as these five cases illustrate it, it's a lot of back and forth between the surgeons and the heart and the structuralist uh about what we think is best and i think it's sort of interesting pretty much right down the middle on all five cases here. Uh, Jason and, and Eric were blind to the ultimate paths that we took at UVA, but it seems like they came to pretty much generally uh, similar conclusions, uh, which again, I think speaks to how people are, you know, try to be thoughtful and making these decisions. And if you go down certain roads, you may burn certain bridges. Uh, and so I, I think it's just critical that we have input of both teams in deciding it. And like we said earlier, particularly with aortic valve disease, it's a dumb valve and it has a fairly straightforward solution with mitral disease. It's a totally different ball game. 
and a lot of these technologies are at their infancy. I saw a question about uh, what you guys do with your with your uh, when you do these. I assume this is a regarding atrial clip. What do you do with your? You know, when when we do left atrial appendage closure with with uh, um, Watchman, we do a forty five day follow up TE typically to look for device related thrombus and make sure you have complete closure with no leaks. So the question was, what do you guys do with your with your atrial clip cases? Are you looking at 45 days similarly? And then do you stop anticoagulation or do you continue anticoagulation regardless? I can never get the cardiologist to take them off the anticoagulation after I do it. And, and sometimes I'll get a CTA to prove it. Uh, so the CTA results atrial clip are obviously pretty impressive uh, if you compare it to a watchman. But it's actually um, pretty variable. It's actually pretty variable. Yeah. So there's a lot of centers where where I, maybe you're very good at putting the atrial clips on, but apparently there's a lot of centers out there that that don't get either all the lobes or that have um, some residual lumen. And so you can actually have a leak inside the atrial clip. I have to admit, our guys are pretty good at it too. I don't really ever see that, but, but yeah, popping everywhere. You do, um, you do need to pick the right version of it to the anatomy you're seeing. Cause if you don't get across the base, it's sort of worthless in my opinion. Yeah, I, I would agree with Keenan. I, we, we um, so uh, Dr. Shore, even here specifically at Fairfax, we don't have on the surgical side a protocol where we're doing the follow up imaging, but the electrophysiologists are all, I think, you know, so um, just acutely aware of it that and, and careful, uh, you know, to their credit, that they're all getting some imaging. And it's usually a CTA. And, you know, to Keenan's point, even when I've cut the appendage off and I tell them, hey, it's gone, I guarantee you it's gone because I threw it in a bucket, they're still getting a CT scan. Maybe they just don't trust me. But uh, yeah, everyone's getting imaging. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I, from my perspective, I would just add that as part of the protocol for the Watchman device, we end up doing T's post procedure to make sure that it's been truly isolated. And I think when I have had that situation where there's been a clip put on, um, since there's the absence of a clear protocol, I will have shared decision making with the patients and usually will end up discontinuing long-term oral anticoagulation in the context of shared decision-making um, with verification of isolation. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, the surgical literature is actually um, such that atriclip plus Eliquis beats Eliquis, right? That's your literature? So I guess the question is, should we be doing, <laughs> you really want to lower your risk of surgical, of uh, stroke, do we do Watchman plus Eliquis or Atriclip plus Eliquis long-term? So there's a, that's a whole other uh, VCSQI discussion is, is left atrial appendage management and anticoagulation management. Great idea for the future. Yeah, that actually is a really good idea. Um, there are a lot of questions with AFib and anticoagulation that we have yet to answer uh, in my mind. The other thing, I mean, I think the other thing that we learned from TAVR trial is, trials are that um, we, we see some degree of valve thrombosis, whether it's whether you're talking about mitral or aortic. And, and I, don't, I don't know that surgical valves are routinely scrutinized the same way that we do with transcatheter valves. Now, we don't have a, at least at Carillion, we don't have a programmed regimen where you do one pre-discharge TTE, one at one month and one at one year, you know, sort of a, just a free-for-all. And I, I think that's been a disservice to the surgical literature for a long time. We're actually learning a lot more about surgical valves, whether it be, again, aortic or mitral valves, as a result of these transcatheter trials. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about how we should be managing those. Yeah, I anticoagulate my mitral tissues for sure. Um, well, <laughs> I should qualify that. I'd say majority of mitral replacements I do are on drug users, so I don't uh, anticoagulate. But when they're not drug users, then I, I will anticoagulate for at least three months. Um, and, and often I'll pick Coumadin over Eliquis. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point. But I just mean in general with just scrutinizing follow-up echoes to, to rule out device-related thrombus early on. 
Yeah. Because we know that, we know what happens certainly with with bovine tissue valves surgically and with transcatheter valves. So should we be doing the same protocol for surgical valves with a pre-discharge echo, regardless of whether it's mitral aortic, pre-discharge echo, one month echo and one year echo, and follow that in the STS registry the same way you do the TVT registry? That's a great question. I have to admit, I don't routinely anticoagulate my aortic valves, um, but I don't know if others do. I, I mean, I, the, the I, transcatheter approach. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't um, I routinely anticoagulate my tissue valve replacements in either position. But, you know, your point's well taken, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, long-term follow-up, uh, we kind of do these cases. I mean, for the for mitral valve repair, it's different. I mean, I get a, a pre-discharge echo on everybody just because that is, I think, kind of the standard of care now. But for replacements, you know, we sort of just, we do them and kind of just send them back out into the world. And we're not really um, scrutinizing it in the long term, other than kind of whatever the cardiology-directed follow-up is. Alan, do you have a perspective to add about, you know, just the idea of anticoagulation? I mean, certainly, you know, over time, you know, we, a, a tissue aortic valve was getting routinely anticoagulated for a period of time, a, a mitral valve. I remember when I first came up uh, here from Emory, uh, you know, probably half the faculty in Atlanta would anticoagulate a tissue mitral. Um, and it was only here where I kind of saw a whole group that where everyone was pretty, you know, uniformly uh, not doing it in the practice. And I know that was something that evolved over time based on following outcomes. We haven't, uh, I haven't had a coagulant and aortic valve in three decades, and uh, you would think you would have recurrent uh, presentations with with uh, embli if there was an issue with it, which uh, we haven't. Uh, for mitral valves, uh, the anticoagulated the bioprosthesis for three months, and then uh, the group sort of split. Some did, some didn't, and the ones that didn't, didn't have any more. Uh, thrombus, uh, thrombi appear up here clinically and present with stroke symptoms. Uh, and so all of us quit anticoagulating the uh, both valves. Uh, this you, is you think with the, the uh, follow up echoes, if there was a clot that had formed, uh, that Robert, the Robert Shores of the world would see those on their follow up echoes, which are done pretty routinely within the six month period. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't mean to cut some uh, Yeah, I, you know, I, th uh, this is David Wyatt. Uh, yeah, I, I think we're kind of mixed here. A, a few of us anticoagulate our, our tissue valves, particularly the mitral valve for a few months. I think there's some data that the, the rate, you know, as you know, the straight ro stroke rate is very low, but the majority of, this, of the thromb thrombotic events that you have with the tissue valves being extremely low occurred in the first three months. So that's kind of the rationale for someone who is is um, is low risk for anticoagulation of just putting them on that. But I mean, I agree with I agree with um, with with Alan. I mean, if we look at in in terms of just the individual experience and people has been in practice for 20 or 30 years, you know, we don't view not you know, not doing that as is, is is a big issue in terms of what people's individual experience has been. It's just sort of that, that small amount of data that's out there regarding that. It's interesting that in the, uh, you know, in the Taver literature, we see that routine anticoagulation with Eliquis lowers your risk of device-related thrombus or, or, or at least subclinical leaflet thrombosis, I'm sorry, and, and HALT and RELM, they call it, on CT. Um, however, if you just do it broadly on everybody, like we were talking about with the surgical patients, then you end up with a higher mortality. So there is some sort of uh, uh, selection bias too that you could, you could end up getting in trouble with. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the problems in, 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 the, in the counter argument for, you can say, well, if it's just for three months, what's there? well, we'd see people come in with complications from anticoagulation, you know, pericardial effusions or tamponade or whatever. So, um, I mean, there's certainly a, a um, I think more more downside anticoagulation if you don't feel like you have a you know good indication for doing it in the post surgical patient. I guess since this is a mitral talk and a transcatheter mitral talk, um, what are your role? What do you guys do with your with your transcatheter mitrals? So we put them all on warfarin, and I basically keep them on warfarin as long as they can tolerate, but at least three months, and then if they can tolerate longer, I'll keep them on warfarin. Same. 
Yeah, we've, we've adopted that too. I'd say probably over the last two years, that's been consistently our practice. Very good. Well, appreciate everybody's discussion here. Um, Dr. Shore, Dr. Spear, would either of you care to offer any closing thoughts for us this evening? Uh, for, from my perspective, and I'll defer to Alan in a moment, um, this has been a fabulous uh, discussion, really engaging and very much appreciate the participation of some profound experts that we have in the Commonwealth. So thank you very much. Also some ideas uh, to talk about and discuss moving forward as we try to uh, deliver outstanding care in our Commonwealth. Alan? I would certainly echo that and would uh, thanks each of our uh, presenters. Uh, I think that uh, we've been privileged to hear this year uh, the two talks and uh, from uh, many of the same uh, groups and uh, the the expertise that we enjoy in Virginia has been is excellent to both uh, as compared to within their region and then uh, compared to national standards. The uh, we've had uh, an overview of from uh, our previous talks with with Taver uh, and its status, and then the current mitral and uh, tricuspid approaches, and it's exciting to see both what's been done and then uh, what is coming uh, in the future devices as we're moving uh, toward handling the valvular disease more uh, percutaneously. The only caveat is that we're not there yet. And so the rush to consider, <clears throat> particularly in some of the applications for MitraClip, and Keenan, uh, you're to be congratulated with the transparency and showing that uh, just because we can do something doesn't mean that the results are going to be uh, acceptable. And so thank you for sharing both sides of the coin uh, in, that, in, in, in your approach. I think that's a very credible uh, uh, way to do this. But um, the, despite all the excellent results with mitral clip, there's a population that don't do well. And you get into the three and four clips uh, and the uh, what's going to be the status of both with stenosis as well as recurrence, and uh, should that be abandoned and go to you know reconsider the intervention, particularly in those that have uh, relevant tricuspid coexistent disease and severe pulmonary hypertension. <clears throat> but the uh, the data is in the results. We'll see what uh, uh, rolls out with broader application uh, for these clips, and then with the uh, newer transcatheter mitrals. Uh, they are more invasive, but at the same time, um, uh, the results have been very promising. So uh, we've got a great overview this uh, these past several uh, sessions on, on percutaneous approaches. And thanks to all of you. Uh, and uh, from I've learned a lot myself, and I'm in the office next to Eric. And so um, it's really been enjoyable. So thank you. <clears throat> Thank you again to our wonderful panelists this evening, to all of our board members and the rest of our VCSQI members who have attended this evening. Take care, everyone. Next meeting is December 8th. Stay safe, stay well, and we will talk to you soon.